go. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening uh, for tonight's By the Book event uh, brought to you by the University of Chicago Press. Um, we will be um, speaking tonight with Rachel Hope Cleaves. Really excited to launch her new book, Unspeakable A Life Beyond Sexual Morality. Uh, Rachel will be in conversation with Alexis Co. Um, so I just uh, go over a few things before we get into it. Um, make sure your microphone is muted. I think hopefully we got everyone, but if not, uh, just make sure your microphone's muted and your video is off so there's not any background noise or distraction during the conversation tonight. Um, also, uh, as we get closer to the Q&A portion at the end, um, ask that you put your questions into the chat box, which you can see down here in the bottom uh, middle of your of your Zoom window. Um, just throw your questions in there and, and then I will uh, get those out to our uh, discussants and we'll moderate the Q&A that way. Um, and tonight's event should be closed captioned, um, so I want to thank our closed captioner, Mary Birnbaum, for that. Um, yeah, I also want to thank the Seminary Co-op, our local partner in Chicago, great bookstore, who have been supporting us for all of our Bite of Book events. Um, yes, yeah, so I will give a little bit of background on tonight's uh, conversance, and then I will hand things over to them. Um, so, Rachel Hope Cleaves is a professor of history at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. In addition to Unspeakable, which is of course the book we're here to uh, hear about tonight, she is the author of The Reign of Terror in America, Visions of Violence from Anti-Jacobinism to Anti-Slavery, I hope I said that correctly, uh, and Charity and Sylvia, A Same-Sex Marriage in Early America. Alexis Ko, our conversation partner is a historian and the author of You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington, and Alice and Frida Forever, A Murder in Memphis, which uh, will soon be a major motion picture. So with that, I will hand things over to Rachel and Alexis. Thank you. Um, first of all, congratulations to Rachel Hope unspeakable, which I have had the privilege of um, starting. Hello. Alexis, you vanished. I did. I'm very sorry about that. Hopefully that will not happen again. If it does, we're going to move to a different location. Um, hello and welcome. First of all, congratulations to Rachel Hope, Unspeakable, which I have had the privilege of reading, and I know that I am among the few here, um, is the first thing you will notice is, is it is beautifully written. And I think that's really important to start out with because I don't say that about all or many history books. Um, this is just exceptional. It's beautifully written, the use of source material, all of this will. Um, be very exciting to you when you receive it. And it's an important contribution that I'll be celebrating throughout the evening. Um, and I wish that we could be celebrating in person. I hope, you know, I wish that Rachel Hope could hear lots of oohs and ahs from the audience instead of having you all muted. Um, and we could really know, you know, really appreciate that this moment is so big for an author. But this is the demarcation in time in which a manuscript, which is a thing in process, a painful process, becomes a real book that you can hold, that you too, Rachel Hope, will one day be able to hold, hopefully soon. And I have a good idea of how long it took um, to write because our last books were in conversation with each other about six years ago, per, you know, published within months of each other. Um, and here we are, once again, causing trouble in the same year. Um, Unspeakable is being launched in the middle of a Alexis, you're freezing again for me. Oh dear. Do you wanna? Hi. I assume, I assume this isn't on my end. It... Do 
do you want to try? Hi, okay. I'm going to. It seems like it's, I think it's on your end. Your yes, through. if it's not working. Okay. And I'm going to go in a different room, which was unplanned. So you'll have to give me one moment. I'm very sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, book launches in the age of COVID. What? Book launches in the age of COVID. Um, yeah. Hopefully there's okay. a better future awaiting us yeah. soon. And this hopefully is, is a better connection at the very least. How are we doing? Good? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So I, as I was saying, as I figure out where to put everything in this new world, um, I have a good idea of how long it took Rachel to write this because our last books were in conversation. And um, this, when she began writing this six years ago, she did not imagine launching it under these circumstances. And so as we discuss and celebrate this book, um, you can submit questions and they'll be emailed to me. And that will be the way that she can interact with you and understand how you're receiving the book. And so I really encourage you to do that. Um, and, you know, I hope that, that you will enjoy the conversation, but, and that I will, I will cover some of your topics, but, um, if I don't, let's, let's make sure we get through it. Um, you're very aware, as you say, in the beginning of the book and as, as you have said throughout this process of the challenges that it faces. Um, we see it in the title, Unspeakable. You know, I, I see this being thought of throughout the book from the moment you see it, every page. Um, you wisely address it in the intro. Um, and it's not to degrade this conversation by bringing up Twitter, but that is also a medium we use. And you um, wrote something really interesting. So I'm gonna quote you not from the book, but from Twitter. I knew this book would be nearly impossible to sell, parentheses, it was, and nearly impossible to market, parentheses, it is. But I thought it vital to research because racial sex was common in the past and remains so today. There's so, for 140 characters, you really worked it in. There's a lot going on there. And I wanna to return to this idea at the end, as far as um, what we choose to study and, and what that means. Um, but I think it's really essential before we get started, given the content, um, to, to go over a couple points here. We're going to be uncomfortable during this conversation as you have been for you know six years. Um, and, in order to do that, sitting here in 2020, we really need to understand what um, it was like for the subject at the time. Um, and so we need to understand the way you can see Douglas as a pedophile and the children who we today would call victims or survivors. So let's start there with the idea of Douglas or really any other pedophile as a monster. And you reject this. Um, you do this for many reasons, but one of the ones I found provocative is that um, calling them monsters obscures our ability to see what's happening, not only in, in research, but also at the time when abuse is happening. Um, you conceive of this. Okay. Uh, that's a lot to handle. I just want to uh, pause and thank um, everybody who's here um, for coming and joining us this evening, um, for making time. And I know lots of people are overwhelmed with the amount of uh, Zoom uh, responsibilities, events on their calendars. So I, I really appreciate people being here uh, tonight. And um, I also realize um, very few of you, except for um, a handful of um, you know family and friends uh, who are here have very few of you have read any version of this book. <laughs> so um, you're also coming to hear a conversation about a book that you haven't read, which is challenging and on a topic which um, I think basically everybody finds uh, deeply challenging, which is probably a good 
uh, segue to Alexis's question about um, my basic approach um, in terms of terminology and, and, and my framing of this book. And so, um, so Alexis has asked a number of things. She's asked about the use of like language, like how do we, um, what, what sort of language do I use to describe uh, Douglas and the children and, and, and how do I frame my introduction to him? Well, so um, for, for people who haven't read the book yet, this, this is a book about what I call the social history of sex between adults and children uh, from the basically late 19th through mid 20th century, but it's told through the life of a particular individual, this uh, mostly forgotten writer named uh, Norman Douglas, who uh, during the 1920s and 1930s was very prominent in British literary circles and very well known and very influential on a lot of writers whom we remember very well right now and whom we continue to read. Writers like uh, Vladimir Nabokov or uh, Joseph Conrad, uh, D.H. Lawrence, Aldous Huxley, and, and really, you know, um, many other writers who are sort of in the stratosphere of, um, you know, British letters in the first half of the 20th century. And so, um, so the book um, is a social history of sex between adults and children, but I tell it through the life of Norman Douglas because um, two very important reasons. Uh, first of all, he was an unrepentant pederast who was remarkably honest about his um, sexual life. Um, throughout uh, his lifetime, both in conversation and in writing and in practice. Uh, so his um, uh, sexual encounters and long-term relations with children, primarily with uh, boys, but also with girls, uh, were not really a secret from anybody throughout his lifetime, or at least anybody who was willing to um, uh, look openly at, at, at uh, what was going on. Um, so he was remarkably open and he left behind this remarkable archive. Um, so this is the reason I tell, so this is what the book is about, um, this sort of social history of uh, sex between adults and children as it captured in this, you know, really unusual set of documents associated with Douglas. The terminology was extremely challenging for me in writing this book because we uh, live in a moment where we have a very specific discourse around pedophilia. It's an incredibly powerful discourse. It's really, in a lot of ways, the third rail of our culture. It's incredibly um, uh, toxic to <laughs> engage in any but a sort of limited uh, set of ways. And I mean, I think the power of um, anti-pedophile discourse is really uh, on display right now in um, uh, current like QAnon conspiracy theories, right? In the way in which fears of pedophiles and satanic pedophiles and cabals of satanic child eating pedophiles have been mobilized um, in, in such powerful ways uh, in, in, in our current political moment. So, um, and yet this language which um, is uh, so engrossing right now is really anachronistic for understanding um, uh, the ways in which sex between, or rape as we would say today, between adults and children, uh, it, it's so anachronistic for understanding how these uh, practices were understood at the time of uh, that Douglas was alive, which is like the fairly recent past. And so maybe it's surprising to us that things might have been so different in the early 20th century. And yet they were. And for example, um, the word pedophile really doesn't uh, occur in the sources uh, from Douglas's life. It's nowhere, in it, it just wasn't a common um, uh, term used before uh, his death, which was in 1952. So when people did speak about um, his sexual relations in the first half of the 20th century or late 19th century, they referred to them uh, as a pederasty, which had its own set of um, connotations. Um, so in, um, in writing this book, I didn't want to uh, 
use uh, pedophile discourse because I felt like um, it would um, fail to capture this other historical organizing system uh, for uh, intergenerational sex, which was the topic that I wanted to address. Um, I just still felt like uh, contemporary, that contemporary language would have um, made it impossible really for us to reckon with this prior historical system. Um, so, um, so I do talk about um, intergenerational sex. Uh, this is to get to this terminology question. This is an ex a contentious term because I think by the standards of our time, we don't see any possibility for sex between adults and children. We see it as rape, right? Um, and not, um, not falling within the framework of sex or sexuality. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't use uh, the discourse of survivors or necessarily abuse to make sense of um, the sources. Um, but I talk a lot about um, how power and consent um, and agency and exploitation um, and violence might have entered into um, uh, Douglas's um, uh, sexual history. So, um, so I tend to avoid um, the sort of buzzwords of contemporary pedophilia discourse because I, I don't think they capture the historical moment. But on the other hand, I try at the same time to uh, bring into the text a thoughtfulness about exploitation and violence and, um, and all of the concern and consent and all of the concerns that obviously are at the forefront of our minds when we're dealing with this topic. It's, it, the connections that you made are really provocative, um, indeed, that the reason we can't um, have this knee-jerk reaction and why we, we do need to, as academics, also use different terms um, is that we see what it does. We can see what it does all the time. Um, I, I, and let's get to this idea of children that we're not really calling, we're not calling survivors and we're, and we're not calling them victims either. And it, this was one of the most challenging parts of the, the book for me. Um, it's, and this is challenging as a reader and as, as you know, certainly I'm sure as an author, um, you know, can you tell us about the children who I will say, you know, to use my language, were sexually abused by Douglas, but, but they wouldn't use that language at all. Um, and in fact, the way that they talked about um, it's dangerous territory here, you know, I'm thinking more, I come from early America, you wouldn't call Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson a relationship, you know, this is all so fraught and connected, but it, um, tell us about them and tell us about how these, you know, you have to call them relationships because they endured, um, what they look like, because I think that's going to be really surprising to people. So, um, so Douglas boasted throughout his life. He, he liked, he, he liked to shock people with, um, his language and he was a raconteur and, uh, he spent a lot of his life, you know, at, um, cafe tables and at dinner tables. Uh, he was an extrovert. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, uh, where is I going with this? Um, oh, Douglas liked to boast uh, to people that he had had sex with over a thousand virgins. This was like one of, he writes about it as well, but so like one of his, uh, his witticisms. Um, and I think um, by that, you have to understand um, by the term virgin, he means children, right? Um, and just to be clear, um, Douglas preferred um, children uh, between, like who were sort of on the cusp of puberty, but not yet pubescent. And I'm sorry to make people uncomfortable, but one of my, um, one of my arguments in this book is we actually have to be uh, honest and open about, you know, th the nature of the history of intergenerational sex and can't shy around it. So Douglas favored in particular boys between about the ages of 10 and 12, although, like I said, he also had a lot of um, sexual encounters with uh, young girls 
um, and adult women. And in fact, um, I think the only um, sort of uh, category of people he was not particularly interested in sexually was really adult men over a certain age. You know, he could like tend upwards towards the late teens or something, but I think he lost interest in when, um, uh, when people cross the threshold into adulthood. Um, and so, uh, so he boasted of having thousands of sexual encounters. I use the word encounter a lot in the book because I think it's a capacious word that does not exclude violence at all and also doesn't exclude um, uh, affection. You know, the word encounter can mean a lot of different things. And so I find it useful for that. Um, Douglas's encounters were incredibly various, as you might imagine, uh, given the amount of sexual encounters he had throughout his lifetime. And so he had many ephemeral sexual encounters with children, which uh, basically uh, would look like prostitution, involved some exchange of money or um, uh, material goods of some sort, you know. Uh, so he had lots of sort of ephemeral en uh, uh, encounters on the road, ephemeral, ephemeral encounters with um, uh, children he he met in hotels, on um, you know, hiking trips, um, elsewhere. Uh, he had sort of longer-term um, uh, prostitution relationships with boys, um, you know, that might last a couple months or um, you know, repeat um, encounters. And then he had a series of very extended relationships that he called affairs or love affairs. Um, I think probably everybody who's listening to me right now um, would have a hard time uh, <laughs> swallowing Douglas's um, uh, depiction of his uh, extended uh, sexual uh, relations with 12-year-olds uh, as, you know, love affairs. That's how Douglas uh, um, framed them. And in these extended affairs, uh, these were the relations that most closely hewed to historic definitions of pederasty, um, this, you know, ancient Greek tradition as um, romanticized and revivified by uh, British and German academics in the 19th century. Uh, so this is like the, the British and German mid-late 19th century romanticization, the neo-Hellenic romanticization of ancient pederasty. And in that relationship, um, in that ideal, the relation between the um, adult and the child was uh, long lasting, involved mentoring, instruction, and affection, and was part of uh, the cultivation of the child's like adult um, sexual normativity. Like it was part of like cultivation into the, a boy becoming um, a, a man who would eventually marry a woman and have children. and. Uh, uh, be a, uh, a, a robust man. Um, so Douglas had a long, had many of these long relationships over the course of his life. These longer love affairs, and um, his um, the children in those affairs for the um, oh, really uh, all of them, as far as um, are captured in the sources remained extremely close to him throughout their lives. So he would have a, um, a sexual affair uh, lasting, you know, two years or three years or sort of the window that he was most interested in, usually terminating by the time the kid was like 16 or so. But then he would remain close to them throughout their adult lives and they would come and visit him. They, he was um, made, uh, you know, like a god, he didn't believe in God, but <laughs> he served as like a quasi godparent for, you know, their children. He, he would repeatedly visit people for decades, you know, people whom, um, uh, men whom he had first encountered when they were boys, had sexual relations with them. Uh, then he would come back and visit them, their wives, their children. Uh, in, in the decades that followed. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, it's incredible. He was, as you said, you know, um, you said it and, and you say it throughout the book, incredibly charismatic. And I think that's something that we really can't undervalue in this situation. Um, and that he was also a storyteller. 
And um, all of this made a big difference in these relationships, but that was so um, challenging is a word I'm going to use a lot tonight and, and you know, uncomfortable to see that um, and, it, and fascinating. I mean, this is why we have to look at it. Um, I would not have expected it to be so consistent. And so we're getting to the archives themselves because when we think of pedophiles today, we think of dramatic headlines and, you know, the seizing of laptops or, you know, um, things that are found. Um, we, but we understand that these things are difficult to find, that, that these, these people are being chased, that it takes detective work. And historians are detectives and we act that way in the archives. Um, and when we write biographies, we understand that people are hiding things from us. Um, what's interesting is that they, they often hide the wrong things they don't know what we will judge them about. They don't understand that how we'll interpret them. Um, Douglas left you what sounds like really incredible archives, um, overwhelmingly so. And so, you know, could you give us an idea of how this compares to um, to other? pederasts of his time or in the general, you know, in pedophilia and, and because these things are hard to collect and, and not necessarily something that um, archivists were always interested in um, or even overt. And um, what that was like for you to be working in that for such a long time. So both from a historian's point of view and from an author, a person's point of view. So I wrote this book because of the sources. This was not a book that I, I set out to write. I didn't write. Uh, I wasn't curious about the history of sex between adults and children. And then I thought, oh, I'll start digging and I'll find something. Um, like most of my historical projects, this book came out of a discovery in the archive. Um, but actually, I, I, I should backtrack that. Because the first inkling I had of writing this book was um, I had read Douglas's most famous novel, uh, South Wind, which he published in 1917, uh, which is an account of um, the sort of wild cosmopolitan expatriate community in the island of Capri at the uh, turn of the 20th century. I'd gone on a, a like a three day vacation to Capri and I decided to read this book. I didn't know anything about him or the book. I just wanted to, you know, have like vacation appropriate nerdy reading. Uh, so I did. Um, and I got very interested in um, his depiction of all this sort of like sexual weirdness and coppery at the turn of the century. And I thought, oh, I'll read Douglas's memoir. Um, and then I'm gonna like, then I'll really know the true stories. Uh, you know, and I'm like, I know this is foolish and people lie in their memoirs all the time as Alexis said mm -hmm. in the question, right? They hide things, but whatever. I was still interested for like the facts behind the fiction. So I got his memoir. Uh, Looking Back, which he published in 1933, and I started reading it, and it's it's really an amazing book in, in terms of its structure and its writing. I think it's uh, a brilliant book um, and very engaging, but um, the book includes like several lengthy and extended anecdotes, you know, like honed through conversation about how he purchased children for sex, like from their parents, you know, made arrangements, um, and he's very open about uh, both that it's sexual and that they're children. And I thought to myself, like, how in the world did, um, how in the world could this book get published in 1933? Like, this is this famous author, right? And, and uh, you know, rather than like, he doesn't, he doesn't talk about, he actually was married for 10 years. It's a horrible story. So he was horrible to his wife. Uh, it's a big surprise. But um, he doesn't mention his wife in the memoir. He doesn't mention his children. Like he, he, he hides the things that you think most people would share in their memoir. And he highlights, you know, the things that most people would hide. Um, and so actually, in some ways, I, this book comes out of the fact that Douglas was so public. And it's not that he was public because like nobody looked askance at sex between adults and children in 1933. Of course they did, like it was not a reputable thing to do. And there are plenty of uh, people in 1933 who, you know, reading the book are like, this Douglas admits to some horrible things, <laughs> like how could he? But he, he had already by that point made his reputation as like a disreputable 
figure. And so I think of it more in the lights of like now, if we read a rock star's memoir who talked all about their drug use, like we wouldn't say, oh, like, you know, using crack is great, but um, it's, it's a disreputable thing that also you can get away with, right? Like it doesn't make you an irredeemable person if you talk about your, you know, years of trashing hotel rooms and, 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 you know, crazy drug use. But, you know, nowadays pedophilia exists obviously in this other category for us where you're not a redeemable person if you talk about, oh, those wild times you had, um, you know, purchasing children for, uh, you know, sexual exploitation. So reading this memoir made me curious about what was going on that the world in the mid thirties, which doesn't feel that long ago to me. Um, although I realize time is passing. <laughs> it still, it feels, you know, as a it doesn't, yeah. As somebody who was an adult in the 20th century, like the thirties doesn't feel that long ago to me. Um, and so how, you know, how could it, how could it have been so different? And that's what led me to the archives where I then discovered, um, that there were some incredibly explicit sources, um, uh, primary sources about Douglas's sexual encounters so that it left the realm of illusion where I could, you know, where I may, might have had to traffic in like, well, maybe these relationships were sexual, we'll never know, right? But like, right. No, no, the sources use words, uh, you know, not the, the, the memoir doesn't use dirty words because it's published in English, you know, so it, it was published in a time of censorship when, um, you know, excuse my language, but words like cock or something couldn't appear in the published memoir in 1933. But in the primary sources, the unpublished manuscript sources, that word appears. And other words, you know, describing explicitly which sexual acts he was engaged in committing. And it was when I found those sources that I said, I have to write about this. And the reason I have to write about this is because for exactly this thing that Alexis says, like, it's hard to find sex in the archives. It's really hard to find um, non-normative sex. It's hard to find like illegal non-normative sex first person in something that's not mediated by a court record, right? Like this wasn't an arrest record. It wasn't a prosecution. It wasn't witness testimony. It was like a first person account. And on top of that, or and second person, or sorry, yeah, third person, first and third person accounts. And on top of that, and this is, I think, really important, it wasn't pornographic. So these sources, I mean, there is, um, uh, you, you know, graphic and explicit pornographic material about intergenerational sex or pederasty from uh, the late 19th and you know, early 20th century from this time period. But those are, of course, you know, written with the intent to titillate readers. And a lot of the stuff from Douglas's archive is not it, like, it's not even written to titillate like it, he makes fun of himself he makes fun of the children they you know it's it's gross like it's 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 like weirdly um disclosing it was i thought as honest an account as i was ever go as anyone was ever going to get of like what the social practices around an incredibly common form of sex from that time period were. Um, and so it, that's why I wrote the book. Cause I found those sources yeah. and I said, it would be irresponsible of me as a historian of sexuality to let those sources be buried. Like I gotta, I gotta bring them out into the world. I mean, yes, absolutely. And that's, um, I, I really can't emphasize how unusual it is to find this abundance and this rich as, as, though we're talking about this material, of course, again, challenging, to find this sort of rich field. And you discuss some of it, you know, you have journals, you have letters, you have these things, but you also have so many eyewitnesses to him and his behavior. And so you have, you know, exactly what you would think, you have people traveling with him um, and basically saying what he's doing. It's just like when you travel with anyone and you write down what they're doing and who they're seeing and if they're up to no good. and. I mean, the the detail again is is incredible, and so it was this thing where you you had to do it, or else you're sort of complicit in silencing it, which I feel like is so much of challenging history. Um, but then, yeah. I mean, to get back to your question about the you know um, what you found so surprising about the sources from the children who express affection for him and who remain sort of devoted to him throughout their adult lives for decades after 
those initial encounters. I mean, the the challenge of you know being beholden to the sources is that the sources say things that you they don't, don't mean. Want them to yeah. Say, right. Yeah. Oh, and that and and that you don't want them to say, but also that you're not totally sure they mean or you can trust or that they mean at the moment. I mean, yes, all of these things. Yeah. I, you know, I think the I think um, if if there hadn't been sources by the children, it would have been an easier book to write because I could have, I, I would have been much easier to simply depict him as a monster, right? But mm -hmm. if I was going to be honest about um, the sources, then I had to acknowledge that, you know, the, the way in which the children responded to Douglas also does not fit easily within our uh, anti, you know, pedophile discourse of today. And of course, um, one of the things I struggle with in the book is like, how do you interpret letters written by kids? You know, it, it, letters are constructed documents. People write them for all sorts of reasons. They want things out of the people they're writing to. We can't just accept letters as some sort of, you know, transparent expression of the heart or something. And um, so I recognize that in reading um, the sources written by the children, but there's also, um, you know, a history of actions, right? In mm -hmm. addition to the letters. So it's, I have the letters and I also have the evidence of the children's repeated, you know, or adults, you know, they're continuing visits to him over the years. They're welcoming him into, uh, their homes, you know, their um, other sort of like expressions of ongoing um, affection, you know, and so that's, uh, you know, that's, it, it would have been a much easier task for me to write this book and to publish the book and to market the book if I didn't have that, because that, like Alexa says, I mean, that's like the most uh, challenging and uncomfortable part of the project, but I think um, it's, essential to uh, acknowledge it, reckon with it, and think about what it means. Absolutely. Um, so we've, we've talked about this. I mean, the reason you came to this um, book was that Douglas was a writer. And um, I really like in the beginning, you sort of do a brief assessment. You're like, some of them were good. Some of them were boring. You know, this is my opinion. <laughs> As as you know, it's he's a we can be subjective about his work. Um, and the thing is, though, again, you know, we talked about this. He comes into contact with a lot of names we do know, De of, for instance. Um, and we should talk about that. Um, but I, I really want to talk about something that you said, which is um, again, you have it's a great quote the puzzle is not how could such an unappealing man have created such appealing art because we don't really know him not because like no one wants to talk about him because of these deep dark secrets or these open things it's because the you know sometimes writers work just doesn't survive of course ours will survive for a long time <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't um you know the question is you know how could such an unappealing man have once been so appealing and uh, the hardest thing to write about no matter how many sources you have is is charisma is to describe how someone like this can move throughout the world um and he didn't another really hard part for me of was that he didn't just appeal to men you know this wasn't just men having their sexual urges wherever they you know this sort of like acceptance that we're taught women and not just women feminists um radical feminists yes radical names gender we bending, know gender bending lesbian feminist <laughs> yes no he had a huge appeal to um you know rule breaking radical women because he preached a uh sexual philosophy that everybody should do what they want and 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 you know damn everyone else to hell he was a huge advocate of absolute you know sexual and gender liberalism and so that held a huge appeal to um many many women who had um you know radical approaches to their own 
lives and uh, the world. And so, for example, um, the um, poet or writer uh, Breyer loved him, right, and supported him uh, financially for many, many years. Uh, Breyer is sort of identified as a boy um, and, uh, you know, in that it, it sort of, I mean, I think, um, you know, loved Douglas's love of boys, right? And met his boys who he brought um, with him to visit her on numerous occasions, right? I mean, she also wrote, you know, disparaging things about how, um, you know, base he was, you know. So, I mean, there was love and there was hate. And that was true for a lot of Douglas's relationships. He also had sort of frenemies like D.H. Lawrence, you know, and blew hot and cold. And there was a lot of, you know, fighting and making up. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, Elizabeth David, uh, the, the food writer, you know, famously fell in love with Douglas when he was in his 70s and she was in her 20s. Um, and, uh, you know, Nancy Cunard, uh, loved him um, and uh, devoted, uh, you know, many years to him and um, all sorts of uh, radical women writers. And so, yeah, he was charismatic that, of course, um, and, and, and like Alexa says, you know, it's such a challenge, right, that um, you can read a thousand things about how somebody's um, personal charisma, but you, you, I, you can't be there, right? He had incredible charm. He had grown up, um, you know, as sort of like, he wasn't, he wasn't exactly aristocracy. He was like petty, you know, he was like one step below aristocracy. His, his grand, one grandfather was a baron, you know, the, uh, you know, he was descended from lords, you know, he, he so he had grown up in this sort of elite milieu and he had amazing manners. Um, I don't know what that's like, so I'll just have to take the first words for it. He knew exactly the right height to like stand up if you walked into the room, you know, but, um, but he was totally dismissive of all of that crap. Um, so I think that's probably a very engaging, um, you know, combination of characteristics. Um, he was, he was considered very witty, although if you read the book, you will probably not appreciate much of his humor, a lot of which is, you know, awful, um, things that are not funny, like the joke is lost, the joke <laughs> no longer resonates in uh, 2020, if it resonated in, you know, 1920. Um, but people considered him very witty. He was a great linguist. He spoke many languages. He was well known for his ability to, to curse in many languages. He jokes about, you know, making a, writing a book about like Tuscan curse words, the words of Tus you know, curse words used by Tuscan cab drivers. But he, uh, his first language was German. So he spoke German, he spoke English, and he spoke Italian, and he, he spoke dialects of Italian, um, Russian. There was a time when he spoke Greek. Uh, he, so he was incredibly smart, well-read uh, of the classics. He didn't really read a lot of modern stuff. So he, he was apparently extremely charming. But um, that is not, that does not explain entirely why he was so appealing. Um, and I think to understand why he was so appealing, in part, we have to understand how different the sexual order was in the first half of the 20th century than it is today. And so part of the reason why he could be so appealing in a way that he wouldn't be now is because the limits of what was acceptable were so much more narrow then, right? Like the, so many more people were excluded from what, um, you know, Gail Rubin calls the charmed circle of uh, normative sexuality that um, lots of people who we would not now see as like fellow travelers with a notorious pederast could see him as a fellow traveler, right? Like, like people like Elizabeth David or Breyer or Nancy Cunard, that they were, um, his appeal was that he was part of this, you know, he, he was like a standard bearer for everybody who 
um, opposed the narrowness and hypocrisy of um, conservative sexual norms in the first half of the 20th century. And that's lost on us because, you know, now that the charm circle is much, much wider, the people who are outside it, like pedophiles, are like way outside it. And we don't see any connection, right? So let's go back to this idea of writing history, you know, will be difficult to sell to a publishing house and then difficult to sell to readers. Um, this doesn't happen a lot with biography. Um, it should, but it doesn't, right? Biographies um, tend to be reverent. Um, people have a hard time hiding their emotions. You don't, spoiler, Rachel doesn't fall into that trap here. Um, they look for people who adhere to their worldview, to their moral sensibilities, um, in part because we spend so much time with these individuals as we write these books, um, and in part because that's what makes them comfortable. And that's the kind of history they want to tell about a person because a biography is never just about a person. It's about a country. It's about a way of life. It's about a religion. It's about um, a sexual preference. It's a lot of things, but rarely is it just one thing. Um, history shows us, and particularly the kind of history that you work on, that morality is a, to a large extent, a construct that um, changes over time. And there are important lessons that we need to know in order to apply to the, to the present. So Douglas's story is essential, but at the same time kind of impossible, as, as you talk about. Um, you succeeded here. You wrote this book. You got it published. I have read it. <laughs> Many other people will. So... You are the, the winner here because it's true that many have in fact failed. This is, this is sort of staggering. It was, it was, a lot of us don't talk about this, but we all have ideas. We all have things that we wanted or tried to write and it was just impossible because the source material wasn't there, but this is not the case here. So talk to us about why you are standing when so many have fallen. Well, I should probably give thanks to my editor, who I think is in the room somewhere, <laughs> I, uh, Tim Mennell, who was kind enough to, um, you know, get, uh, ah, there he is, I saw him, um, understand what I was trying to do in this book and believe in it. And so, um, so credit for the fact that it's been published, I think, is due to my editor and to the University of Chicago Press. Um, I heard from a lot of people on the route uh, to meeting Tim that this was an unpublishable book, that no press would touch it with a, uh, you know, 10 foot pole because um, it was saying things that were, you know, touching the third rail of contemporary culture, which is our, our pedophile panic. Um, a third rail. It's not the only third rail. Um, so I did, in writing the book was, I mean, it was, you know, I don't know if like talking about like the emotional experience of the writer is interesting at all. I'm very lucky. I am a tenured professor with job security in a place where I am happy. So there, I had the privilege of a level of job security where I could take a risk. And on top of that, I want to acknowledge my privilege as a middle-aged, you know, married mom. Um, and while you might, you know, while it's possible that this book will set off people's alarm bells that I am, you know, secretly a pedophile, I think I am in the category of like least likely to be suspected of being driven by my own, you know, illicit passion for prepubescent children, which I, I know it doesn't need to be said, but I don't have that passion. Um, so I think I had a privilege of being in a kind of like in the, the most, the least suspect category, you know, um, by virtue of my, my gender, my gender normativity, my sexual normativity, you know, my race, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, the, and then my, um, you know, job security, that I was able to take a risk uh, because 
in fact, as I pursued this book, I spent a lot of time thinking like, I, this is never, I'm, you know, I'm never going to be able to publish this. Um, and if I do, I'll live to regret it. And in fact, um, you know, my, um, you know, my, my husband was not a fan of this project, as I say in the acknowledgments, uh, for a variety of reasons, among which was that he was really worried that people would, you know, bombard me with hate mail and attack me and that would make me sad. Um, I see my father is in the audience. My father was an advocate of this book and I also thank him in the acknowledgments um, because um, he was a real big believer as were um, other friends and family who I, I know are in the audience right now. So I thank all of you who um, buoyed me through the challenges of, um, you know, working on this project, which seems so likely to be like bound for uh, failure. Um, and as I talk about in the book, like many, 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 many attempted biographies of Douglas over the years have failed um, for a variety of reasons. So there was one big biography that was published in 1976. And that one almost failed. The fact that that one actually came out um, was a miracle. It, it very nearly did not. Uh, it took forever for the author to write it and then it, it um, was nearly canceled. Uh, at the end, but he was in fact inheriting a contract that uh, three people had already given up on. So more or less. Um, so there's a long list of people who just um, really couldn't write, uh, who tried to write about Douglas and, and couldn't because uh, first, um, it was in, it's impossible to write about him without writing about his, um, his sexuality. But for most of his, you know, for most of the 70 years since his death, his sexuality has been impossible to write about. I want to take some questions and then I, I, I will finish with one of my own. Um, but one of the questions has been, you know, were the children all lower class? And I'm reading that verbatim because I think the phrasing is really interesting and I understand the assumption. Um, that is a, a good question, and the answer is surprisingly no. Um, <laughs> the vast majority of them were, you know, so, um, so Douglas, um, he led a kind of peripatetic existence because of repeated troubles with the law, as well as because uh, he got in trouble with the law for, um, you know, molesting, raping, uh, having sexual encounters with children. Um, so he got in trouble with the law at various times, but he also just uh, preferred, um, he liked to spend his life on the road. Uh, and uh, he didn't want to, uh, you know, he preferred moving around for various reasons. So, um, uh, you know, when it came to, so, okay, so he had sexual encounters with children in a lot of different places, and that includes um, England, um, uh, Italy, uh, um, Tunisia, you know, Russia, uh, Anatolia, you know, various, um, uh, you know, what, uh, Sri Lanka, or what was then, uh, Ceylon, you know, um, India, like he, he encountered children in many places, you know, anywhere where um, the relationship more or less con was, is best described as prostitution, I think you can assume that those youth were all, um, working class or poor. Douglas, he initially as a young man had a lot of money and then he, you know, lost all of his money. So he actually wasn't particularly wealthy throughout his life. He was always scrambling, you know, for, uh, you know, he lived off the, the largesse of some rich ladies he knew. Um, he was a, an unabashed exploiter of his rich friends. He didn't have a lot of money of himself, but he did always have his social class. Um, so, uh, so many of his relationships were, or many of his sexual encounters, I should say, were with poor children um, who were selling sex for, and not just to Douglas, but were, you know, in general, um, uh, uh, selling sex to, uh, you know, wealthy buyers or just buyers. Um, but he also had um, longer term encounter, like these longer term affairs with children who were not necessarily um, uh, working class or or poor. I mean, one, uh, for example, um, he had a long relationship with a young kid named 
uh, Rene Marie, who he meets um, in uh, 1918, and the kid's like just turning 14. I think I got that right. Um, and Marie was the son of an engineer. So um, he was in college in French middle school at the time that um, Douglas met him. Uh, he had, you know, like he didn't get along well with his parents. And so um, he wasn't a good student and his parents really wanted him to succeed in school and like pass his baccalaureate exam. It's very French. He had to pass his back and he was no good at, he was no good at his classes. And so Douglas, you know, came in as like, oh, I'll, you know, he can live with me and I'll tutor him and I'll, I'll tutor him in English and I'll, you know, I'll help him to pass his, his back. And, and so in that case, you know, he wasn't, I mean, Rene Marie is not a poor kid at all. He's a very, you know, middle class, his kid, his dad worked for the, um, uh, I think he had a, a, a public job, government service. Um, so, you know, that's one example. Um, and, you know, and there's other, you know, children that he, um, he met and knew. Some, I don't know if every, you know, I, I don't know if every relationship or friendship he ever had with a child ever, uh, you know, was sexual. But for example, when he was in London during World War II, um, his first time back in 25 years after he'd run away from uh, imprisonment following an arrest. Uh, but he, he's allowed back in in 1942 to escape the war. And he ends up being friends with um, uh, Prince Rupert, and I'm not going to get all the names right, but Rupi, the guy who goes on to be like the manager for the Rolling Stones, who, you know, is this incredibly, I mean, he's like the child of ultra aristocrats and Douglas befriends him during World War II and takes him off to, you know, the fun fair and like uh, talks about, I don't know, classical Greek stories. So like Rupi is by, you know, no stretch of the imagination, a poor kid. So you know, there was a mix in there. It, um, this is an interesting question. It has become commonplace today to say that rape isn't about sex, it's about power. And since we now routinely apply the term to pedophilia, how would Douglas and those like him, and for that matter, those aware of his predilections, have reacted to this characterization? That's interesting. Usually you get asked anachronistic questions, but this is asking you to sort of, you know, create oh, exactly. this hypothetical. Yeah, Douglas would have rejected that, of course. Um, so I think um, Douglas, you know, understood himself initially in life to be a libertine and, you know, I think eventually kind of entered into self-conception as a pederast. He wrote a lot about sex in all sorts of ways and he celebrated sex in all sorts of ways. He wrote a lot of erotic, uh, you know, he wrote about aphrodisiacs and he wrote, um, he, he uh, wrote sort of uh, sexual novels uh, and he, so he was like obsessed with sex and, um, uh, he loved classical pornography, you know, he, I don't think he would have understood um, his sexual desire for children within that framework. That doesn't mean that that framework doesn't apply, but if the question is, you know, what would D Douglas's reaction, I can almost guarantee would have consisted of um, old-fashioned four-letter Anglo-Saxon words, as he liked to put it. Um, this is, so, so there's a, there are a lot of questions around, as you know, is expected, the relationships with children and who then became adults, um, the interactions. And, um, the question is, you know, did these boys turn men who welcomed Douglas into their family circle? Was it such that he would have similar access to their children? That is a fine question. Um, so occasionally I've seen in the sources like some of his like literary friends who weren't people he necessarily, like not people he had had sexual encounters with when they were children. Some of his literary friends tried to like restrict access to their children, although most people seemed totally unconcerned. Um, but there are some, there is some stuff in the sources about, you know, people being like, oh, my parent, my, my father would never let me be alone in a room with Douglas, which was like wise. Um, but I don't, I didn't see, 
anything in the sources where um, adults who had had sexual relations with Douglas when they were children were at all restrictive about his access to their children. I mean, and I take, for example, another one of his long-term relations was with this um, a boy named Emilio Papa, who he met when he was, Douglas lived in Florence for most of the 20s and 30s from about like 1919 to 1937. He had to flee in 1937 for an advance. He was, he was going to be arrested for raping a girl. Um, and he also had all sorts of issues with the fascists. It was complicated. So he, he runs away in 1937, but he, he lives there for about 20 years. And, um, and he has tons of sexual encounters with boys during those years. That's why he loves Florence so much. And it's not just him. There's a, a lot of uh, German and uh, British pederasts who live in Florence in those decades because Florence is great for if you're interested in, in boys, there's like a thriving culture of uh, child prostitution and pederasty, et cetera. Um, and so one of uh, the boys who, uh, one of the many, many, many boys who Douglas has encounters with during this period is a youth named Emilio Papa, who becomes very close to him um, and remains like his, kind of like his secretary, um, uh, and a assistant long after um, their sexual relationship has ended, as far as I can tell, Papa gets married with um, Douglas's, you know, very active support. Like Douglas was always pushing these boys whom he was having sexual uh, relations with, he was always pushing them towards flirting with girls and becoming ladies men, right? Like that's the vision of pederasty is that's, you know, part of the mentoring by these adult men of these boys. So. So um, Papa gets married and then, um, you know, Douglas has like, um, like dinner every Sunday with Papa and his wife and their daughter. And like, that's the one I was saying, he's, he's kind of like a godfather for their daughter, although not really because Douglas doesn't believe in God. He was a strident atheist who absolutely despised religion, hated religion. But, um, you know, he plays that sort of role in their life. And then Papa actually dies tragically in a, um, plane accident right after World War, plane crash right after World War II while he's on business for Douglas. And then Douglas remained close with Papa's widow and uh, Papa's daughter in the years afterwards. He let them live in his apartment in Florence, rent free for a while, much to the extreme anger of Douglas's own hard up, permanently, um, you know, uh, 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 grasping sons, uh, not their fault. They had a rough life. Um, and um, and, and, and uh, you know, Papa's widow and daughter end up uh, being at Douglas's funeral seven years later, so six years later. So uh, I didn't see a whole lot of evidence that um, in the after years that um, these youth who had had encounters with Douglas went on to try to protect their own children. But of course, it's entirely possible that they did, and that just didn't enter the sources, right? So, um, I don't, I don't know. It's possible that the the adults welcomed him back, but you know, sent the kids out to like go collect chestnuts or something. As there is curi yeah. I mean, there is curiosity um, around his children, around his wife. Um, you know, can you summarize those? those relationships, um, you know, what that marriage was like, what the relationship with the sons was like. Um, the obvious indication also is, you know, did he, did he um, have interactions with incidents with his sons? So, um, so I write, there's a chapter of the book that is about Douglas's marriage in which I try to make the argument that I think it's like the most abusive relationship of his life, like, judge, like the most normative relationship he engages in his marital his marriage you know to a woman i think is by far like it's the worst story it's a horrible story um it, there's multiple versions of the story and in the chapter i um compare three different versions of the story none of which are told by douglas um so one is from his wife's diary one is from a there was a novel about 
their divorce that um, was written by somebody else, but based on his wife's account. So I talk about the her her account of the marriage at the time in her diary. Um, this account, this fictionalized account of the divorce written by a novelist uh, with access about 10 years later. And then um, also uh, um, other, uh, oh, other versions from um, stories that had been told along the way. So Douglas does talk about it sometimes, very little. He basically refused to talk about it. But uh, the, the story is more or less that um, his wife was his first cousin. It was his mother's sister's daughter, um, Elsa Fitzgibbon, uh, Louisa Theobaldina Fitzgibbon Douglas, eventually. Um, and he got her pregnant. Um, and uh, her, her mother, his aunt, hated him, considered him satanic, um, and didn't want him courting her daughter, his cousin. Uh, so I think they did an end run around uh, parental uh, disapproval by uh, getting her pregnant, but they eloped, they got married. And even though um, uh, Douglas was born in Austria and as his cousin was, even though uh, they lived in Austria, the, he, they eloped to uh, England, that's where. Um, and then um, he marries her in England and in part possibly because he knows he's eventually gonna get divorced and he's like trying to get the marriage in a um, uh, jurisdiction which is going to be favorable to the um, uh, interests of fathers when he eventually divorces her. So um, he, it's a, it's, it, it's hard to say uh, how happy or unhappy the marriage is. You have to read the chapter. The sources are contradictory. I talk about it, but the marriage ends. Um, and he, he's not faithful. And um, according to her, according to him, she's not faithful either. Uh, and he manages to um, get the children, get custody of the children because he pursues the divorce in Scotland where the, which is where his family is actually from and it's his legal domicile. Um, so he uses his legal identity as a Scotsman to divorce her in Scotland, which has favorable uh, laws that allow him to keep custody of the children and initially she his wife then goes off to Munich to make a new life and initially they're sort of he's allowing her to uh, see the children but then she does accuse him of uh, molesting the older boy Archie and he punishes her uh, so she tries to get custody full custody of the children and he punishes her by taking the children um, and uh, farming them out to like, friends and relatives in England, including Joseph Conrad, who um, was the sort of in loco parentis for his younger son, Robin, for many years, um, and never lets his wife see the kids again. And she actually, she becomes a, an alcoholic. Maybe she already was, according to Douglas. I don't know at what point she became an alcoholic. And she dies in a bed fire um, during World War I, uh, you know, caused by presumably passing out drunk with a cig lit cigarette. It's a horrible story. And a lot of um, the family, since they had the same family, since they were first cousins, a lot of the family never spoke to uh, you know, Douglas again because of the way he treated his wife. So what actually gets him in trouble with a lot of family members is not his molestation of uh, children, it's his abusive treatment of his wife that he destroys her life. Um, and um, the children are raised, end up being raised basically in boarding schools and by friends and relatives. Um, and they both had very troubled lives, but, and saw very little of their father or of each other. Um, and they were estranged from each other, the, the two boys for most of their um, lives, but um, they remained loyal to him uh, despite it all. And Douglas was, a, incredibly open with his sons, especially the correspondence with his son Archie um, is all available. A lot of it is at UCLA. Some of it is at, um, a lot of it's at UCLA. A lot of it's at the Beinecke Library at, at Yale. A bunch of it is in an archive in um, Austria. Uh, but, uh, you know, Douglas writes super openly about um, his sexual encounters with boys um, to, in his letters to Archie, as well as other things. I mean, our, and Archie saw it up front 
and you know met lots of the boys who uh, Douglas had ephemeral and lasting encounters with. So yeah, but they defend him in the end, and uh, and there's quotations from Archie in the book where you know he says. Um, I never thought too much about my father's relationships with boys, except he seemed to, you know, enjoy their company, something like that. They cover up for him after his death too. Um, this is interesting. I, I, you know, we talked about the sources and how you had letters from some of the boards and the ongoing relationship. This is a question about, um, do you, basically asking if we can speak to the experience of the children um, who he had sexual relations with, uh, had interactions with, um, in a commercial sense. And I, yeah. So asking if, if, you know, prostitutes, if, if you were able to, um, get any source material from them. Yeah. Some of the letters are from, um, uh, youth who he had, um, who the encounters were, um, transactional financial transactions. So um, when he initially as a young man, he joined the British Foreign Office uh, and his first posting is to um, St. Petersburg. So we haven't had the chance to talk about his, his writing, but as a, as a young man, he was deeply interested in the natural sciences and he wrote a lot. He, he did a lot of um, sort of research into um, uh, the development, uh, he was very interested in um, lizards and uh, snakes and the natural world. So he goes off to Russia in part because he's like interested in um, a particular uh, legless lizard that is native to uh, Russia. Um, and once he's there, he realizes his Russian is not adequate to the task. And his story is um, that um, a friend of his says to him, well, the answer is to, uh, you know, coucher avec son dictionnaire. You should get a, a, young a, a young lover who will teach you Russian uh, because you're sleeping with them. And he says, I'll set you up. And so he sets up Douglas with um, a young girl. We have a picture of her. I don't know exactly how old she was. It's not in the sources. I'm guessing in her mid-teens maybe old enough for her uh, mother to have considered it appropriate, like an okay age to contract out um, for this purpose. And there, and I, I have some stuff in the book about like the age of prostitutes in brothels in Russia in the 1890s. And there's plenty of children, like 12, you know, that's her age range in brothels at the time. Um, and so there's letters from um, this particular um, a young, um, transactional sexual partner uh, to Douglas and they're super affectionate. Um, you know, can you read them straightforward as expressions of the deep affection of her heart? You know, probably not. I mean, she wanted things out of Douglas, money, a bicycle, visits, whatever it was. But, um, you know, it's also possible that they are expressive of affection, right? And uh, she gives him gifts and she, you know, she seems more annoyed in the letters, um, which are after he's left Russia, that he's not seeing her than, uh, you know, anything else. Like she's placing demands on him that he's not, um, you know, he's not meeting. She wants more of him. Uh, you know, again, the letters are open to interpretation. So, um, but, and then the other way to judge, I think, the nature of the feelings of um, the children who are involved in transactional encounters, um, a, another way I look at that is through um, these diaries of his uh, travels where he often had repeat encounters in different years, 33, 34, 35, with like the same um, children in a given locale. So he would like go to Ischia or go to, um, uh, you know, this town called Santa Agata, which is in the, um, uh, like, Neapolitan Peninsula across from uh, Ischia, for a little further south. Um, and he would go on these repeat uh, visits, and when he would return, uh, the children whom he had had sexual, paid sexual encounters with the previous year would come back and go, you know, find him and track him down, um, because they wanted to renew the acquaintance. And of course, 
large reason why they wanted to renew the acquaintance was because they wanted the money or, you know, the other, um, uh, you know, material um, goods that came with that acquaintance, you know, that sexual arrangement. But, um, but actually, like, there's evidence in the sources of, like, the kids fighting over access to Douglas because he was obviously, you know, the combination of what he had to offer, both materially and in terms of his company, was appealing. So many of these questions um, are in the book. They are answered in the book and um, incredibly detailed. Again, the source material is um, abundant, I think is a way to, to describe it. And the, the use of it is incredible. I think that we could keep asking these questions all night and there are questions around books. Have you read this? Did you know about that book? And I know at least one of them um, I saw cited. So the answer is a general yes or very likely, I'm sure. Um, I know that we all wish that we could be there with you live and we, um, the collective we, who hasn't read it, which excludes me, um, is very excited to, and I know that you're placing orders if you haven't already from the University of Chicago in order of best for Rachel Hope. It is University of Chicago, then um, bookshop.org, and then Amazon. Is that correct? Sounds good to it's me. A good, it's, a good, it's a good tier. Um, good for society, good for Rachel, good for everyone. Um, and uh, I also really encourage you to not only consider this as a, a view of someone's life and a view of the past, but um, an incredible, we didn't get a chance to discuss it, but an incredible look at the structures that we still see in place and how they work. And, and, um, and I think there's, I mean, it's just, it's a really incredible book and a really necessary contribution. You can't say too often that something wholly original has really entered um, entered you know your space and it really has so congratulations on that and um a wonderful book again beautifully written and thank you all of us um you know think of all of you for joining and um and we wish you all the best of success with this i just want to say a thank you to thank you to everyone who made the time and thank you so much to alexis who volunteered to do this and to of course not big fan not just labor, but like emotional labor of, you know, I hope so. tackling a, a really, a topic that a lot of us don't really want to tackle. And so thank you so much. Very worth it. Very worth it. Thank you so much. Um, and have a good night, everyone. And make sure you order the book. Good night. Bye.